Okay, so um, just delighted to be here. I'm a cross-cultural psychologist, so I'm continuing on the theme of, of psychology. Um, and I've been interested for a long time in how strict or permissive are social groups uh, and what causes those differences and what consequences it has at different levels of analysis. So I'm going to just kind of talk about a lot of studies, actually, at a high level to, talk about, to show you how I address this issue. So for example, why in Singapore, uh, which is called the fine country, anyone from Singapore out there? Um, are you not allowed to chew gum? Uh, there's lots of different rules around flying kites, many, many different prohibitions and punishments around not flushing the toilet, um, and even walking naked in front of your curtains. Um, and that's true, I checked that out actually in this, as a statute. Whereas if you actually go across to New Zealand, you'll see people walking barefoot in banks. You'll see uh, people burning couches on college campuses. And New Zealand's the only place that I know of that has its own national wizard. So this dude, this is a true story, not fake news. He was actually a retired uh, and then fired professor from Australia who uh, basically set up shop in, shop in New Zealand streets and was lecturing on everything from rugby to religion. And instead of actually uh, really punishing the deviant, the prime minister of the country gave him a license and declared him as the national wizard. And his job was to entertain the country, and he has been doing that. He actually launches himself from large eggs on top of libraries and other things and blesses the rugby team as they're playing and so forth. I mean, going in other places around the world, you see why in Germany in general do you see people waiting patiently on city streets, whereas my own uh, original hometown of New York City, people jaywalk with great frequency with their kids in tow. Uh, this, this is also a very interesting thing. This is a new device that's been invented. I talked to the owner of this, country, this company in Germany. It's called Street Pong. And this dude here is playing ping pong with the person across the street. And actually, it shows you when the, the light is about to change. So it's an extra incentive to kind of stay put uh, on German streets. Um, and but on a more serious note, why, why do people, are they allowed to smoke weed openly in the Netherlands and in some parts of the US, whereas you can get the death penalty for this in other countries? Or perhaps closer to home, what explains some of these puzzling trends that, for example, we have more unique baby names <coughs> over time in the United States? And also, why are we getting fatter and fatter? Is there anything that kind of unites these trends? On the issue of baby names, I'll say my colleague at Columbia Business School, Michael Morris, told me that he was in a supermarket asking where the candy was, and they said she doesn't work there anymore. <laughs> so you can see this in popular culture. Now, clearly, these things are very diverse. Uh, but what they all share is that they are uh, examples of social norms that have either been unwritten or formalized. And of course, many of us who share an interest in social norms are interested in their functionality. Why do they develop? And we know that they develop to help us coordinate and predict each other's behavior at an incredibly amazing scale. And often it's the case that I try to violate norms around the world when I'm traveling just to kind of see how people react because we take them for granted. They're this omnipresent force in our lives, but we take them for granted. So if I came here wearing like a bathing suit, you find that really strange. Or if I started Jake Brinkins out some bourbon or calling my daughters, you think, you know, why did she co-organize this conference with Sergi? Like, get her out of here. Or why do we, you know, walk, why do we drive on certain um, areas of the street and not others? And why don't we steal people's foods off their plates like I've tried to do in Germany? Uh, even things like having sex, we, we know that it's reserved for private settings. We don't often start having sex in movie theaters, maybe on Seinfeld, or in public settings. And there's a good reason for that, because we invented social norms. And we really perfected this incredible tool to help us coordinate and predict. It's the glue that keeps us together. But what I've been focused on is how this glue is stronger or weaker in certain social groups. So this is what um, I've inherited these terminology from Pierre Topelto. And I call this the difference between tight and loose cultures. Tight cultures have many strong norms and strong punishments for deviance and loose cultures having uh, more tolerance and much more permissiveness and a wider range of behavior that's seen as permissible. I do want to mention that Herodotus, who kind of looks like my old academic advisor, Harry Triandis, uh, actually was one of the first people who was talking about this in the book, The Histories. I see that, that book as the first cross-cultural psychology text. Uh, and he was differentiating the strict rules of Egypt with the more loose, permissive rules uh, of Persia. Uh, but even bef you know, around the same time, you see differences between Sparta and Athens. Sparta, a militarized type of lifestyle uh, where even the most uh, minor violation result in very serious punishment compared to Athens, which was a bastion of permissiveness and, and gorging and feasting. 
Um, and other people have identified in ethnographies this kind of difference. But I wanted to start looking at this more systematically in modern nations and states and even zooming into things like social class and seeing whether there's a common principle or set of principles that helps us understand why these differences evolve and what trade-offs they provide for human groups. So I'm going to talk about a lot of data to show you what this looks like. Some of it's correlational, some of it's experimental. I'll present some brain data. Um, and just at the end, start posing the question, which is better, tight or loose? So you can kind of think about that so as we, I'll ask you to vote in a little bit. Uh, so the first um, study that we did on this topic was published a few years ago um, where we looked at whether we can actually measure this reliably across nations in the modern era. So this is not a huge sample size. We had to actually stop collecting data at some point. Um, and it but reflects a lot of differences around the world. We chose these countries based on some theory we had around what might cause the evolution of tight loose, and I'll get to that in a minute. But what we wanted to do is, just like we can identify differences in personalities, like extroversion, introversion, we wanted to see, can we actually provide a metric of tight loose across nations? Now, of course, every nation has both tight and loose elements. So we're thinking about this as a sort of um, microscope metaphor. You can broaden out to a very large scale level of abstraction and see if we can compare nations. And that's what we did. We developed questionnaire measures where people were asked in all these countries to report on the norm strength in their cultural context. We also asked people to rate how permissible 15 behaviors were across 15 situations as an indication of the range of behavior that's permissible in the country. And what was really important was to first see, do people even agree on this across nations? So we use RWG statistics. We can see that people actually agree on norm strength when we frame these questions in terms of their countries. Um, and also it correlated in expected ways with other variables, including things like on the World Values Survey on social deviance attitudes and so forth, and other data. It was also distinct from GDP. For example, places like Singapore and Japan um, were tight, but also wealthy. Uh, and places that were loose could also be wealthy or could be poor. For example, cultures that were loose that were rich include places like the United States, New Zealand, Australia, but then places like Greece and Brazil tend to struggle. Um, and also you have tighter cultures that are also poor on the flip side of the rich continuum, including Pakistan, India. Uh, the dimension was also distinct from things like collectivism, individualism. So for example, and I worked a lot on this distinction with Harry, uh, but a lot of what we've done in cross-cultural psychology is confound collectivism and tightness and individualism and looseness. So think about this as kind of a two by two. They're related but distinct. And we've been comparing East Asia, which is de tends to be tight and collectivistic with the US, which tends to be loose and individualistic. But we can look at the off diagonals, including places like Austria and Germany and Switzerland, which tend to veer tighter, but are more individualistic. And places like Italy and Greece and Brazil that are more collectivistic, but more loose. So that's just to say that we first spent a lot of time dealing with divergent validity and convergent validity. But what we wanted to know, first of all, is what predicts tight loose. This is correlational, but I'll get into some other data later on that may help to make the case for some causality. Um, but these countries that were tight and also loose didn't share any common geography or any common language or tradition or religion. But they did share something important, and that had to do with basically ecological threat. And the argument was, going into the study, was that countries that have a lot of threat, whether it's from mother nature, like constant disasters, like in Japan, or human-made threat, constant invasions by your neighbors, tend to need stronger rules to coordinate to survive. These are collection action problems, so they need strong rules to help groups coordinate. But groups that have less threat, um, in general, can afford to be more permissive. So that's what we set out to test. As I was gathering the survey data, we were gathering data on how many invasions or potential invasions country had, had over the last 100 years using the International Crisis Archive database. Uh, as an aside, during the study, my then five-year-old said to me, are we worried about Canada or in Mexico invading us? <laughs> Maybe some people are worried about that now, but you know, that's just something to think about. The US has, is, has been, relatively speaking, and we'll see some differences at the state level in a minute, has been separated by two oceans uh, by other continents and has had, with some exceptions, very little con constant conflict on its own soil. And we can see what happens when we start to have conflict on our soil. Um, later on, I'll show you what that data looked like. Temporary threat can produce very similar types of effects, albeit um, more fleeting. 
Um, but other types of threats, including things like population density. Uh, some countries like Singapore have about 20,000 people per capita, compared to uh, New Zealand that has 50 people per capita, and more sheep per capita than people, I'm told. And actually, this very small fact helps to explain these puzzling issues around gum and the ban on gum in Singapore. And the story goes that people in the late 80s were chewing gum, and a lot of people who chew gum, what do they tend to do? They throw it on the floor. Yeah, I don't chew gum, but people throw gum on the floor. <laughs> and you know what was happening in Singapore was this kind of crisis. There was gum all over the place, and it was actually blocking sensors on subways and also on elevators. And so Lee Kuan Yew, who's basically a good cultural psychologist, said, guys, you know what? We're just going to have to ban gum altogether. And in that very small space where there's a lot of mouths per capita, that seemed like a reasonable strategy. So I'm not saying all cultural norms and differences have this kind of rationality, but it helps us to be a little bit less judgmental uh, when we think about it. So I want to just show you some of the data. This is um, now looking at things like food deprivation, population density. This goes back to 1500. D natural disasters a country has, territorial threat, as well as pathogens, um, all have an association with um, the degree to which norms are tight as compared to loose. Uh, there are some really interesting exceptions we can talk about maybe during the break. Israel is a good example. Um, and um, Israel tends to have a lot of threat, but it tends in general to have a lot of looseness where people are, break the rules a lot. Um, but one interesting factor um, is that <coughs> diversity promotes looseness and debate promotes looseness. And if anyone's Jewish out there, you know that Jews cannot agree on anything, including folklore. <laughs> in recent Passover Stater, you read a story in, about Passover, and there's all these footnotes about all the disagreement about the interpretation on the story. So that, that helps to understand, in general, uh, why this might be uh, a looser context. But the question is, what trade-offs does it provide for human groups? And I'm, what I'm going to show you some data across different levels is that it produces a pretty reliable trade-off on order versus openness in human groups. Um, so for example, across the board, we find that there's less crime in tight cultures. Um, there's more monitoring. We've measured how many police per capita, how many security cameras per capita there are, and there's much more, uh, really, people watching you. Um, and tight culture is more religious, so even su supernatural types of monitoring is found more in tight cultures. And R. N. R. and Zion would say that watched people tend to be norm abiding. Um, also, tight cultures have more uniformity. We've measured how uniform people are in their dress, even in their cars. I sent RAs out all over the world to go to parking lots and measure the, the make and the color of cars to see how uniform are there. That's a nice unobtrusive uh, uh, um, indicator when you're starting to think, is this place tight or loose? Uh, we've measured also how synchronous clocks are in city streets um, and connected it with our data. So in places like Austria and Germany, clocks around the city say the same time. They're pretty like, off by a, a nanoseconds, milliseconds. Um, but in places like Brazil uh, and Greece, the clocks are really, really well, very far off, including in Italy, where I spent some time recently. You're not totally sure what time it is. Uh, and also the stock market, some recent data show that stock market synchronicity is higher in tight cultures. More buying and selling coupling, that's called R squared, occurs more in tighter cultures. And also what we find is in general, there's more self-control in tighter cultures. When you're worried about following rules and being punished, you tend to manage your impulses more. And we have data on that at the individual level. We see that there's lower alcohol, drugs, debt, even less obesity. Uh, we've recently been get getting some data on pet obesity, and it looks like even in loose cultures, pets are fatter, uh, <laughs> including my <laughs> beloved dog, Pepper. So you know, basically, tight cultures corner the market on order. Loose cultures struggle with a lot of these issues. They tend to have less order and more crime. They tend to be less synchronous, and they have a lot more self-regulation failures. Uh, but loose culture is corner the market on openness. In a lot of our research connecting our scores to the World Value Survey data, we see there's more openness to a variety of different people, immigrants, people who are stigmatized, mentally ill. I've sent my RAs out to city streets around the world wearing facial warts that you can buy on the internet. And it's very clear, or tattoos and purple hair strings, and it's very clear that in tighter cultures you get less help than in looser cultures with these kind of stigmatized identities compared to when you're wearing just your normal face. There's also greater uh, openness to ideas. There's national level on creativity that is linked to uh, tight loose, uh, with loose cultures having more openness to different ideas. And also our computational models show that norms, when you have a shock in a system where a new norm is introduced that has higher payoffs, they actually take off much faster in loose agent-based groups. I want to mention that we've now replicated this 
uh, in the standard sample and pre-industrial societies. Uh, we've coded many, many ethnographies for different domains of life across ethics, socialization, gender, et cetera. We factorize this data based on our codes on norm, strength, and punishments, and we find a clear single factor. And a lot of this data, we can, well, you can't really see what these countries are, but I can send you the paper. Um, but you can see that there's some common logic where the same kinds of threats in this pre-industrial sample is correlated with tight loose, population density, warfare, pathogens, uh, and scarcity. So I'm going to present some data also that I sort of see this as a fractal pattern. This is a metaphor from physics on this sort of recurring pattern across different scales. Uh, hopefully there's no physicists in the audience because when I've given this talk before they get very hysterical or using this term. I'm using it as, sorry, <laughs> I apologize, but it's a metaphor to say, wait a second, is there a homology of this pattern at different levels of analysis in terms of antecedents and consequences of threat as well as the trade-off. And so we started looking at this at the state level. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details, but instead of red versus blue, we can put the US 50 states on a map ranging from tight and loose. The south and some parts of the Midwest tend to be tighter as compared to the coasts. When you look at maps of, for example, this is the New York Times of natural disasters in the US, you can see a very close correspondence with the places that are tighter. Uh, we have other data on pathogens, uh, on scarcity, and so forth that also correlate with this data. Uh, of course, there's also founding effects. People who came to the US and settled in the South came from contexts that were honor-oriented. Honor cultures, by definition, are tight, but not all tight cultures are honor-oriented. The coasts tend to have a lot of diversity as far back as the early 1800s and had a lot of risk takers moving uh, across the country, which also is another force that helps promote tightness. I'll just show you that the same trade-off is also seen at the state level in the United States. Uh, this is all, all archival data where we're linking our measures of tight loose that are both surveys as well as archival data with things like order, more law enforcement, less homelessness, less divorce, less um, drug abuse, at least things like marijuana and cocaine and things, and less debt controlling for GDP per capita in the state. Um, also tight states tend to be more polite. We recently saw some rank orders of politeness in the US states and New York, which is very loose, my favorite home state is the rudest state that exists in the union. Um, but of course, and tight state, loose states struggle on these issues of order, but they, again, corner the market on openness in terms of creativity and in terms of uh, equality, even things like the number of EEOC claims per capita. Uh, also, personality is data that we got from Renfro, who has actual big five data at the state level. And you can see that more people who are open on these personality scores live in looser states. Looser states are less polite, they're more rude, but they actually are more fun on other indicators. So that's at least the trade-off that we have in them. Uh, an interesting recent paper just came out in uh, PNAS. I commented on this paper um, in the issue that it came out, and they actually now, across 11,000 people, have done a, also a map of China on tight loose um, in terms of um, the 30 provinces in, in, in the country. And they find some really interesting commonality, homophily, in terms of the same things I've talked about. The tighter provinces tend to be places that had more invasions by um, Japan over the years, have more natural disasters. The looser regions, with some exceptions, have, are much more distant from Beijing, where eyes are not upon you, and lots of other data that are in this study. OK, I want to just get to um, some work that we've done on social class, because this is yet another level of analysis that we can look at differences in norm strength. And actually, was drawing on the inspiration of Melvin Cohn, who wrote the book Class and Conformity in the late 60s. At least I'm sure there's a classic in sociology. And you know, Cohn was making the argument that parents in the working class train their kids to have, be more rule abiding because they're going to be in jobs that where there's less discretion. So that was a big part of his theory. I wanted to look at this more broadly from the perspective of tight loose theory. Um, and what our argument was that it's not just that working class individuals are going into um, jobs with less discretion, they also face much greater threat. We wanted to see, do they actually report that? Are their neighborhoods more threatening? Wait, I, got, I, I started late, so I'm going to negotiate. But anyway, OK, so I'm just going to go through that. The idea is, what we found is that, in fact, when we ask lots of different samples, working class and upper class, in terms of the meaning of rules, their ratings on the same measures of norm strength that we used in the science paper, we find the same uh, effect that they report having tighter worlds than upper class. Uh, even in studies at UC Berkeley, they show that it's the upper class vehicles that cut people off in city streets, breaking the rules than plumber vans and lower class cars. 
And we've actually linked these differences to greater threat. We've measured perceived threat um, at the individual level. We've looked at census data, tracking people's zip codes. And we can see that threat is in part mediating these differences across the class. And we also see that the same creativity and openness uh, that we find among loose nations and loose states is also found among the upper class as compared to the working class. So the working class is more norm-abiding, but they have less creativity on our tasks, and they also have less openness to um, deviance. I'm just going to mention that we started looking at this at the age three to see how, how far does this go back. And we used um, Tomasello's puppet paradigm, where we can actually can't ask a kid about their ideas about norms, but we can have them interact with Max the puppet. And Max is playing interesting games with them, but then suddenly Max starts violating the rules. And the question is, how do these kids react to this? And in, very clearly in our studies, it's the working class individuals that protest much more and are really upset, whereas the upper class kids are more likely to laugh and let Max off the hook. So these differences start very, very early. Uh, I want to mention that the, the poor, the working poor are different than we expect than the working class, because the people who are in poverty are living in more anime type environments. Okay, I'm gonna have to just go, all right, I'm gonna have to skip through this, but um, I, we started to look at how norms are embrained around the world, um, in particular in US and China, using uh, EEG measures, and the, the clear issue, the clear difference here is that we see that when people are asked to evaluate many different norm violations, whether they're like a person dancing in the art museum or in the public park versus dancing in a tango lesson, which is normal, we could see universally that people have an N400 response. This is a negative deflection after 400 milliseconds in the US and China. But in China, we see much more activity in the frontal lobe area that's involved in theory of mind and punishment. And these differences between US and China predict and mediate a lot of the, tra the tight loose trade-off I was telling you about. So bigger differences in N400 uh, predict higher self-control, higher self superiority, but lower creativity uh, in our samples. Okay, so I'm doing really well on time, so I'm just gonna fly through. I wanted to mention one other study that is also drawn on neuroscience to test some theories about um, assumptions of tight loose theory. The idea was that threat is really producing tightness because it's helping people to coordinate. That's a really useful function. So we wanted to test that, and we wanted to also see how does brain synchrony actually mediate some of these differences. So this is hyper EEG, two brains. And what, I'm just gonna give you a big picture of the results. We had people in China exposed to an in-group threat. It was a realistic threat from people from China in the next five years. The same story about threat, but it was Ethiopia and Eutria, so activating threat, but not in your soil. And then um, in-group threat, which is on China, but no threat. And we had them engaging in a coordination task where they had to count silently on their computer and press a button when they were done across many trials. They were in different rooms and given feedback on these tasks, and then we also were measuring their brain synchrony. And what we were interested in is the role of gamma synchrony, which is about fear, and whether it helps to mediate differences um, in coordination as people were under threat. So you just have to buy the data. Uh, that's all the weird brain data. But basically what we found was that in-group threat was fostering much more coordination, faster synchrony, and it was in part mediated by synchrony. Okay, I'm gonna get to the final set of slides, I promise. Um, so, We've also been doing some work on activating threat temporarily. We did it in that study with the brain synchrony, but we've also been looking at how, for example, after the Boston bombing, we can see the increasing in tightness among people who felt very threatened by this event. We can see this in other threat experiments. We call them ecological priming. We can prime population density, terrorism, natural disasters. They, for, they, they really cause the same exact psychology. And I'm just gonna skip over that and then just get to some Trump data because you can't go without giving a talk about tightness without talking about Trump. But you could see here very clearly that people before the election that felt a lot of threat, whether it was from ISIS or immigration or North Korea, felt the US was too loose. And that in turn was predicting their vote for Trump. We found the same exact pattern in the election in France. So this is just to say that threat real or imagined or even activated by leaders who target threatened groups can um, affect electoral dynamics. Okay, promises the last set of slides, which is better? So which is better? Who's gonna vote for tightness? I got a couple of votes. Who's gonna vote for looseness? Okay, so <laughs> this is an age old debate, um, you know, which is better. You had people like Plato, Confucius, Hobbes that liked rules. Hobbes had a very dismal view of the world. But then you have other, John Stuart, let's just say Mill and Freud who actually thought that tightness was problematic. But what if neither is correct is what we recently published on. 
what if it's really that the extremes of this dimension are problematic for human groups? Uh, this is what we call the Goldilocks principle of tight loose. Uh, it's grounded in even work by Durkheim, for example, who talked about animic suicide, where people tried to escape because the rules were so unpredictable that people couldn't coordinate, or fatalistic suicide on the opposite extreme, which is really re so repressive that people want to escape. So we didn't think he tested the argument in full, so we went out to test this. And what you could see is this is controlling for the linear effect. You could see very clearly that depression, suicide, blood pressure is, is the highest in extremely tight or extremely loose groups. Happiness is lowest in both groups. This is replicated by some other labs. Uh, in the book that I just published, I also talk about this principle in terms of families. Overparenting or, or laissez-faire parenting produces maladaptive kids. Organizations that get too tight or too loose, think United versus Tesla, have really big problems. So this suggests that even though groups have to veer tighter or looser based on their ecology, the extremes are really problematic. OK, the last slide, I promise you, is just, and I think I, I put this here because I think it might influence our discussions or inform some discussions on, I think a lot of the change that we um, can try to think about is how do we tighten loose norms when they've gotten too loose? I would nominate the internet for that. Uh, some, many people disagree with me, but I think it's the wild, wild west, and it, it's a place we live all the time now, and so we need to figure out how to nudge more norm-abiding behavior in a very anonymous, low social presence context, which we know from decades of research produces really weird behavior, uh, but also with context where we need to loosen tight norms that have become outdated, and I think a lot of the work uh, that Carla will talk about when it comes to genital cutting or other norms like having large families uh, are candidates for this type of cultural change. And, we know from our own work that it's harder to go from tight to loose than loose to tight. Um, and so that's another interesting challenge. And I think I'll just leave us with that. Um, and I think I started two minutes late. So I'm just going to be less guilt prone that, that I took up too much time. Thank you. <laughs> um. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm interested in the relation between the tight loose scale and the individual commitment of person of, of a personal individual commitment to social norms. So you've mentioned Israel. So I'm from Israel. So I have to uh, to say something about it. So in Israel, what what we discovered in our research is that you can look at different groups within the society. It's like it is a multicultural society. Yeah. And when different people from those different groups interact, something interesting, something resembling what Alan just uh, exemplified is happening. People adjust their norm system to the norm system they yeah. think they are about to encounter. So it is actually, it, it does not mean that, it's, it does not necessarily have to mean that Israel is loose or loose with pockets of tightness like, like, like you claim, but maybe we can think about Israel as a case study of people who change their commitments, their inner and, and most profound commitments relatively to these social interactions that they have. So I was just wondering, yeah. what is your take on that? Yeah, and what I mean, do you it's think? an interesting possibility. Um, and I certainly think that people do change. We all do. We change our behavior when we're in libraries versus in you know, parties. So we all sort of shift in our tight loose mindset when it comes to daily behavior. But I still think that Israel, in general, has a lot of tolerance for different behaviors in different settings than in Pakistan or Singapore. I think there are certain norms in Israel that are super tight, that transverse communities. For example, norms for having large families. Um, for obvious reasons, that norm evolved. And I know there's a lot of argument around whether that should be shifting. Um, so I, w w I guess what I would say is that we can zoom in and find some of that norm change, but I still think at a more macro level we can characterize the great creativity and uh, you know, the, a lot of my Israeli colleagues would say Jews learn to not follow rules for good reasons. Mm -hmm. So there might be still that proclivity to want you know, to, to violate them. Okay, I'm afraid we're out of time. So. Sorry guys, but we have a lot of time together. Mm -hmm.